to the uh, um, bell curve maximum, there is a, a Gaussian distribution for, for the grades like this. If, if you're like um, above this, you know, there's nothing to worry about. There are two, two people in the class who do consistently poorly on the quizzes. Uh, so um, uh, please uh, try to uh, uh, do something about this. Otherwise, I think um, most of you are uh, in, in good stand and shouldn't worry too much um, about your grades. Again, I want to stress the fact that if you, when you do the tests, you lose points for giving wrong answers, right? So that means if you make two wrong answers, you, you don't have eight out of ten, but you have six out of ten, right? If uh, everything else is correct, right? So. Uh, and that's just because you can just guess your the answer, yes? And if you guess the answers, you'll, you'll always do well, okay? Right, but anyway, it is, it doesn't, as I said, um, but nobody seems to be in problems except the two students who have rather low grades. Uh, and there is time to uh, improve your grades just by um, you know, focusing a little bit more on, on preparation of the quizzes. And some will do very well. So, All right. So can I have your attention for the, uh, the topic of uh, today, which is uh, annealing? So want to tell you that in contrast, repeat rather, that in contrast to the hot uh, strip mill where you end up with a hot rolled material that is fully recrystallized, uh, in the case of cold rolled mill, you, uh, you have heavily deformed material. Uh, so, so the amount of strain you apply here is very, very much larger than the strain you apply, for instance, if you're familiar with you know, making a, a, uh, a tensile specimen, uh, you achieve maybe 20, 30% of deformation. In this case, you easily you know, achieve 70 or more percent of deformation, right? So it is very heavily deformed, hmm? very hard material uh, with no plasticity. What has happened as you, as you did the rolling, you, you have influenced the texture of your material. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, you have created preferred orientations. All right. So the first thing you, you do any time, uh, with the exception uh, of a, a very few uh, products, steel products, is you anneal the material. And you anneal this uh, material um, so, first of all, you need to have enough driving force. So, your deformation, the amount of deformation has to be high enough um, for the uh, uh, recrystallization to be fast. And uh, it, it's a process of nucleation and, and growth of dislocation-free grains. Hmm? And in the process, you create texture. Um, and we've seen that there are two uh, ways uh, currently uh, in use for the sheet industry, which is the batch annealing and the uh, continuous annealing uh, process. They're very different, yes. Uh, this type of annealing you will see in many cases in the, the steel industry, not only for sheet products, but for instance for wire products are uh, also uh, annealed, recrystallization annealed in or I should say, not recrystallization annealed, um, spherodizing annealed in this kind of um, uh, ty general type of furnace. Hmm? Of course, a continuous annealing uh, mill like this on the, on the right, it's exclusively for uh, flat-rolled products. 
uh, right, so we, uh, we did talk about the, uh, th this, the way batch annealing furnace works. Um, so you have a, your, your, your stacked coils are in a protective atmosphere of hydrogen and nitrogen, and, and it's this uh, um, enclosure is itself enclosed into a furnace um, where you heat the material uh, with gas burners. Because you have such a high mass of coiled materials, it takes time to, uh, to ac uh, accomplish the process. Easily a whole day to reach the maximum temperature inside the coil and, and then uh, about uh, even more time to, to cool it. Um, one of the things that you can already see um, or guess that uh, uh, will happen in a batch annealed material is that there may be inhomogeneities, yes? Uh, for instance, say you have a coil, it's coiled like this, so this is the, uh, the coil is like this. Uh, and this is a section of the coil, yes? yes and, and we have gas passing by, yes? And the hot wall of the, the furnace here radiating heat, yes? It's obvious that um, after, if you look at the, the, the temperature variations, yes? That this outer part here, yes, heats up much faster than doesn't need 24 hours to heat up, right? This, the outer part here heats up much faster than the inner part here. Hmm? So there will be a variation in the, uh, the thermal cycle for all the points here yeah, because, and, and, and it's going to be a big one, right? So you have to make sure that your product yeah, is not sensitive to uh, uh, these these uh, big differences in in thermal um, cycles. Hmm? That's point number one. In particular, you don't want to have grain growth here, yes, while it's at high temperature, and and here very little grain growth because it didn't uh, it, it wasn't at high temperature for the same amount of time, right? Okay, so we'll talk about this in a moment. Hmm? So um, again, I, it's important uh, to uh, have, uh, certainly for sheet material, to have this high normal anisotropy, width strain over thickness strain if you test the material. Yes, and that requires uh, us to have a lot of grains which have a one 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 direction parallel to the normal direction of the sheet, so and uh, because you, the orientation in the plane of the sheet is not specified, it's a fiber, so-called fiber orientation. Hmm? Hmm? And so, so it means that if you were able to, to look at the uh, uh, orientation of the unit cell in this, this grain, which has this 111 orientation, that's, that's how it would look like. Hmm? Now, uh, in the plane of the, uh, the sheet, you can still have anisotropy, yes? And we call this uh, planar anisotropy. And when you make a cup out of a sheet that has this, a lot of planar anisotropy, you, you directly see this because you have, dif you have differences in um, elongations in the different directions. And so that gives you a phenomenon that's called earring. Right? And that's due to this delta R being non-zero. Hmm? Okay. Right, now the question is, when, when we do this recrystallization, yes, how do the grains know, yes, that they have to be in the right orientation when they recrystallize? How do they know this? Hmm? Uh, or how do we control this? Hmm? Well, what we need to do hmm, is that 
when the recrystallization occurs, yes, we have to make sure that the grains with the right orientation, yes, recrystallize faster and grow faster than grains with other orientations, yes? And this in particular for batch annealed uh, grades, yes, is done by having recrystallization, yes, occur at the same time as the precipitation of a compound. And that compound is aluminum nitride precipitates. Aluminum nitride. Um, how does this work? Hmm? Well, um, first of all, we need to look at the recrystallization start temperature. Hmm? So let's, let's have a look at that. Yeah, if we want to understand how uh, we control things in the uh, in, in batch annealing processing of formable steels, yes. The recrystallization the start temperature decreases. Hmm? Uh, it has this has this shape here. Yeah. Decreases like this with time and um, you yeah. know. Okay, so uh, um, just. Uh, just to make sure you understand this. Uh, so, actually, yes. um, if we have a, um, if, if you are at high temperatures, yes, it takes you a certain time to start recrystallization, yes? And the higher the temperature is, the shorter it takes to recrystallize. Hmm? Right. So if I'm at this temperature, the recrystallization time will be very much longer. The reason is because you need a rearrangement of atoms, so your diffusion, etc. cetera. So, uh, so this is what you see here, the straight line, the recrystallization start temperature. Hmm? This is temperature and this is time, yes? In this case, it means time to start the recrystallization. Hmm? So if I'm at this temperature, yes, I will have to wait a certain time to see recrystallization start. Yes? All right. For, um, the, you know, when you could try this, and maybe some of you will do this, if you, um, if you have a a piece of material that you have deformed, a piece of steel you've deformed, and you reheat it in the hope of having it recrystallized, yes? Say you reheat it at 200 degrees C, uh, nothing will happen. At 300 degrees C, nothing will happen. Material will not recrystallize, yes? Uh, 500 degrees C, it will take very, very long time. You really have to go beyond the 600 degrees C to really get the recrystallization to start. Hmm? That's, that's basically what this line means. Uh, however, if you're at 800 degrees C, it goes very, very fast, yes? All right. So that's one uh, thing we need to look at. The other thing we uh, need to consider um, in this particular case is the formation of aluminum nitride, yes? Now, In hot rolled band, hot rolled material, we can keep aluminum nitride in solution simply by using a low coiling temperature. Low coiling temperature. Uh, if we use a low coiling temperature, the diffusivity of aluminum becomes very low and I cannot form aluminum nitride in my hot strip. So it's very relatively simple by using a low coiling temperature I can suppress aluminum nitride formation. Hmm? Um, so, and I end up with strip, yes, that is cold rolled and has aluminum and nitrogen in solid solution. 
you don't have to make anything special to get this aluminum nitride. Remember that you always add aluminum to your steels during the so-called aluminum thing, right? You add the aluminum to bind the excess of oxygen uh, you introduced in your steel during steel making. And the nitrogen is just a background amount of nitrogen, yes, uh, which is of the order of 40 ppm, yes, if you do a regular uh, BOF process to make your steel. Um, so you do, yeah. So, so you keep these two elements in solution. So, however, in, um, in ferrite, that is your, uh, our material, right, ferrite, the solubility of aluminum nitrate is very low. Right? So as soon as we have enough, <coughs> enough temperature, hmm, aluminum nitride will form. Yes? And the precipitation kinetics um, look like this. They're basically C-curve. C-curve. And why are precipitation kinetics uh, give you C-type curves? Well, because if you are at very low temperatures, you have very little diffus diffusion, yes? So your precipitates cannot form and grow. If you are very high temperature, the solubility is higher, yes? And so the kinetics of formation of aluminum nitride will be lower. And in particular, if you're very close to the so-called solubility temperature, yes, uh, your, the, the, uh, the driving force to form the uh, dissipate will be uh, low. Okay, so now say I heat up my material and I want to have the precipitation interact with the recrystallization, yes? In fact, I would like them to have happen at the same time, yes? Well, then I need to, my heating rate has to go like this. Yeah, so the change of the temperature with time, I have to make sure that I reach this point. Because at this point, the precipitate of aluminum nitride and the start of the recrystallization occur simultaneously. Yes? Well, okay. Um, if you don't uh, directly understand this, let's do it differently. Let's have a higher uh, heating rate. Yes? A hi higher heating rate. I, th I will reach the recrystallization start temperature long before aluminum nitride is formed. Yes? So there's going to be no interaction. Yes? Uh, or, or let's go do things very slowly. Yes? In this case, my aluminum nitride starts to precipitate long before the recrystallization starts. So they, the recrystallization and the uh, precipitation will not, processes will not interact. Hmm? So this is what you try to do in a back kneeling furnace if one you want to make a very formable steel because the, when aluminum nitride precipitates, yes, it suppresses the formation of non-111 parallel to normal direction uh, crystals or grains to grow. Hmm? So this promotes, when this happens, you promote uh, 111 parallel to no direction grains. You don't really have to do anything special, as I already said, in terms of composition. Yes, um, no expensive alloying element. What is important, however, is this heating rate. It turns out that that's a relatively slow heating rate that is very well matched with the heating rates that you have in batch annealing furnaces, yes? And th that is one of the reasons why you can indeed make very formable steels in controlled uh, circumstances in a batch annealing furnace, yes? Because you, you, can, you need a relatively slow heating rate, yes, to achieve this condition, yes? Right? Now, you can uh, test this, yeah? uh, uh, this phenomenon, yeah? in a very simple way. Uh, so, 
you go to the hot strip mail, yes, yes, and you uh, remember uh, after the the finisher finishing uh, mail, you have a finishing temperature. Then you enter into the laminar cooling, yes, and then you coil the material at a coiling temperature, yes. All right. So if you have a high coiling temperature, T coil is high, then aluminum nitride will form. Forms. It forms because uh, uh, aluminum nitride, uh, aluminum and nitrogen can diffuse to each other and towards each other and form this precipitate. If I use a low coiling temperature, yes, aluminum nitride doesn't form. Yes. And you uh, are left with aluminum in solution and nitrogen in solution, yes? And so you apply this technique here for recrystallization texture control in the annealing furnace. So how do you do? Look, uh, see this? Well, say you coil at um, 750 degrees C, yes? 750 degrees C. 750 degrees C, you form aluminum nitride, yes? So it's not available to control the recrystallization texture in your strip material, yes? So what you get after cold rolling and batch annealing, this is what you get. You get, it's a nice microstructure, you get nice equiaxed crystals, yes? But the R value is low, 1.5. Now, do the other thing. Use O coiling temperature, yes, around 600 degrees C. What you find is very different. Look at the microstructure. Look how the grains look. They look, they're very long and flat, yes. And the R value is 1.8. So this, you can, you can already see from the uh, uh, morphology of the grains that something has influenced the, the, uh, the nature of the grains, the type of grains that have grown, and the way they grew. Hmm? It turns out that most of these grains are, have the right orientation, and that uh, this material, as, as you uh, see from the R value, is, is a lot more formable than, uh, than this material. Okay. Batch annealing furnaces. Uh, the have a uh, an issue as you as we've already uh, talked about. Uh, and the issue is uh, the duration of the process, yes. And the other issue is surface cleanliness. And there is a, uh, in certain cases, um, it is interesting to use hydrogen atmospheres to do the annealing of uh, your, uh, your, your coil. So instead of having a uh, hydrogen-nitrogen mixture with about 5 to 10 percent of hydrogen, you just do full hydrogen. Yeah? In that case, the gas, yes, the gas that's here uh, gives you a lot better heat transfer conditions. Hmm? And, and so you, you heat up your coil faster. So you can see here, this is temperature profile as a function of time for an H a H and X. Yes, H and X means hydrogen and nitrogen mixture. Yeah, or a pure hydrogen mixture. And then you see here that the surface heats up faster uh, than the core, of course, but you, you still need to wait uh, more than uh, 24 hours to get the full heating. And, and the full process takes of the order of uh, 
70 and more hours to complete. With hydrogen, because the heat transfer is faster, you will get much faster heating rate. Yes? And you can see the whole process can be terminated in about 43 hours. Whether or not you apply this uh, will, of course, also depend on the impact it has on texture development of the product. Okay? So it's not always a good idea to do fast heatings uh, because you may not be able to apply this method to have very formable uh, grade. Hmm? That's one advantage uh, of uh, this technology, of having a higher uh, hydrogen content. The other one is that uh, in a high hydrogen uh, uh, gas atmosphere, the amount of carbon residues on the strip surface is much lower. Hmm? And we don't like to have carbon residue at the surface. I remind you of the fact that this carbon residue comes from the lubricant that we use in cold rolling, yes? And uh, the lubricant we use in cold rolling. And you can see here the surface content, uh, carbon content is much decreased when you use pure hydrogen um, uh, gas atmosphere. I, I would appreciate if uh, you wouldn't play with your telephone when I'm teaching. Right, in the uh, continuous annealing furnace, situation is uh, very different. Yes, very different. Uh, the strip processing time is shorter yes. um, because you basically unroll the strip and let it pass through a furnace. Yes. Which, is at in, which contains different sections, which are at a constant temperature. Hmm? So um, the investments, yes, are very much larger than the investments required for batch annealing. Right? So it's, um, uh, companies do not uh, invest as easily in continuous annealing technologies than in batch annealing technologies. This is here a um, typical cycle. Material, cold rolled material gets heated up to around 800 degrees C, slow cooled to an intermediate temperature, and then the, t the temperature is uh, dropped. And sometimes you can have what's called an over-aging. That's where you keep the temperature constant at around 400 degrees C before you cool it. So first I want to uh, point to the fact that the, the, the time it takes for a piece of strip to go from the start to the end of the furnace is of the order of, say, um, 450 seconds, right? So we're talking about the processing time Literally, that's minutes, hmm? minutes. Hmm? The, um, uh, the annealing here, the annealing here is, is done under protective uh, gas atmosphere in a radiant tube furnace. Um, and the gas atmosphere is nitrogen, 5% hydrogen, typically. Hmm? And the, the strip height here, for instance, uh, typically is of the order of uh, 20 meters hmm, in this line. Okay. Now, one of the things I have to say is that uh, there are many different possibilities for the thermal cycle. Yes, and it it's also depends very much on the product portfolio what the thermal cycle will be of the uh, annealing line. But in general, uh, you can um, you have uh, the structure of a continuous annealing line will be as such. You'll have a decoiler or decoilers. Uh, 
at the entry you'll have shears. You need to weld, of course. The tail of the uh, uh, strip to the heads of the next strips. The strip needs to be degreased, yes, uh, and uh, cleaned with brushes to remove iron fines and to remove uh, leftover lubricants and uh, usually that's done the removal of the um, lubricant is done with alkaline degreasing and you can remove uh, even uh, clean the, the strip even better with electrolytic uh, degreasing or and even brushing hmm? then you go through an accumulator you know that accumulators are in these continuous lines to make sure that you can uh, that you have time for uh, situations in which the strip at the entry uh, is stopped. Yes. Then you have a furnace that contains different sections. Yes. A heating section, a soaking section, cooling sections, overaging section, and a second cooling. That's, that's the general layout. Um, and um, so that's uh, typical temperatures for this soaking, the high temperature, that minimum temperature are at least 700. Much higher than 850 you will not see very often. So that's kind of the, the range of temperatures you can play with. Um, and then you have a first cooling and this overaging in a temperature range 350 to 450 degrees C. Now why would you do this overaging here? Um, well, I'll tell you in a moment, just let's, let me finish uh, describing the line here. At the exit, you have an exit accumulator. You do temper rolling. We'll see in a moment what temper rolling is. You inspect this, the strip. There may be some post-treatment required, and you shear off uh, the, the weld, for instance, eh, that um, uh, you had made at the start of the line. What post-treatments, what could be post-treatments, for, for instance, uh, some customers will require uh, special anti-corrosion oils on, on, your, on your strip or, or other things, uh, and, and that's the time where you apply these things. Hmm? Now, one of the, 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 the big advantages of doing things continuously is that uh, productivity goes up very, very much, yes? Um, uh, line speeds can easily be 200 and more uh, meters per second here, meters per minute, meters per minute, right? It's really fast. Yeah? And uh, the, um, what else? Um, yeah, it's, it's fast. And the, uh, the other thing is um, you heat up and you cool down and very quickly also. The, so the heating rates in comparison to batch annealing are very fast. Yeah? So your strip is never really in thermodynamic equilibrium, yes? And in particular, um, when you heat up a, a, a low carbon steel, yes, to high temperatures, yes, you will dissolve carbides, either partially or fully, and then when you cool down quickly, this, these, uh, the, the solute carbon will remain in solution, yes? And that's the reason why some lines have this over-aging section, that is a, uh, a, a section in which you make sure that you precipitate carbides and that you, you do not have carbon in solid solution in your product. Hmm? This is illustrated here. In a, so this is batch annealing situation on the left and on the right here, it's a typical thermal cycle for a uh, continuous annealing furnace. So you see heating and cooling takes, it, just heating takes more than a day for the uh, batch annealing situation. In the um, uh, continuous annealing situation, it takes just a minute or more of the, that order, yes, a minute or two to reach the high temperatures, yes, and then you cool down very quickly. So heating rates and cooling rates are of the order of 0.01 degree per second or 0.001 degree per second in the case of batch annealing. In the case of the 
uh, continuous annealing, we talk about 10 degrees per second or 10 degrees to 100 degrees per second cooling rates. Yes, right. So, um, so if you look at your phase diagram, hmm, what happens with the carbon content? Well, it's no problem for the carbon content to move along the equilibrium solubility for carbon, yes, as we go through the process. In the case of continuous annealing, when you reach this high temperature and you decrease the temperature very quickly, it, it doesn't precipitate as effectively, yes? And so you're left with lots of carbon in uh, supersaturation. And as a consequence, you need to decrease this carbon in supersaturation by having this over-aging step, okay? Okay, so let's now um, give you an example of different uh, uh, thermal cycles in different lines. So these are two lines that carry out continuous annealing of strip, both for automotive applications, but both use very different types of steels to produce the sheet. The one on the left uses low carbon steels. The one on the right uses IF steels only. And IF steels, I remember, remind you of the fact that these are steels with no interstitials, no carbon or nitrogen interstitials. Yes. And you don't have these interstitials because you've added titanium to these steels. And the titanium very effectively binds carbon and nitrogen. So there no, you don't have to worry about interstitials. Yeah? So in this case, this line processes low carbon steels. And yes. So what happens in the case of the low carbon steels in this in line, say, line number one, and this we'll call line number two? Yeah? Well, you heat up. It's cold rolled material, so the first st stage you get is recovery. Then at around 600 degrees C, recrystallization starts. Mm -hmm. And by the time you reach 800 degrees C, recrystallization has started. You get grain growth and texture development. As you decrease the temperature, yes, you decrease it fast, so you get carbon in supersaturation in the ferrite, yes? Yeah. And so you stop before you have a strip with lots of carbon in supersaturation. You do this over-aging where you nucleate carbide and then the carbide particles grow and their growth takes the carbon out of solution, yes? So I get a decreasing solute and then you can do the, the cooling. In the, in, so in this case, you, lo you, lose, you use low carbon steels. In this case, we only use IF steels. You don't have to worry about carbon. So you also do not need a line with over aging. So in this case, you heat up, you go through the, line, the, the strip goes through recovery, recrystallization, and then at high temperature, grain growth and development of the, the right texture. And then you cool down. And that's it. So uh, here it takes you 500 seconds to do the, the processing. Here it takes you about 250 seconds, right? So very different, yeah? And again, uh, both, um, uh, uh, bo both lines uh, absolutely make sense, yes? And, and produce uh, high quality, high formability uh, strip. Now, what is happening? Um, uh, currently, currently uh, annealing lines tend to become a little bit more complex, yes, uh, to allow the producer's flexibility in making more difficult products, more interesting products, in particular high-strength products. For instance, you can make 
instead of having a very formable material, you can make a very hard material. What about a martensitic sheet? Yes? Uh, if you want to make um, uh, you know, a, a products which are extremely strong. Yeah? Okay, well, how would you do this? Well, you would heat up your material. Then go on the, your line would need to have a, a special capacity to heat to temperatures which are high enough so you can turn the, full, the, the structure into fully, austen, uh, fully austenitic, yes? And then you would cool relatively quickly, yes? So you can turn the microstructure into martensite fully. So you need to cool below MS temperature rapidly. You know that um, with martensite it's always better to recover some of the ductility by tempering, and then you would need a small reheating yes, uh, uh, section, temper your martensite at about 200 degrees C. What happens then is, uh, again, you reduce the amount of carbon that's in solid solution in the martensite uh, during this tempering. Hmm? You don't need to go to 400 degrees C in this case because the supersaturation of carbon in the martensite is very high. Hmm? Um, this looks, this diagram here looks very similar, but it's a bit different. Um, if uh, you want to make a product that's called a dual phase product, dual phase product um, is a product, the name s s uh, says it's where you have two phases, ferrite and martensite. And that is produced by uh, partially transforming the microstructure to martensite. This is, you can also do this in a continuous annealing line. Mm -hmm. This is how you do it. You start with a material that's basically perlite fer uh, ferrite that is uh, heated, uh, goes through recovery, and then you do what is called an intercritical annealing. That means you go into the region, let me uh, remind you what the iron carbon diagram looks like on the iron rich side looks like something like this. Hmm? To say I have this steel here with about 0.1% of carbon. Uh, it's, it's not perfectly uh, correct in terms of, yeah. I, I go to um, this temperature here, for instance, yeah. so that, and I stay at this temperature. With, with the martensitic steel, I had to go up to here to make a martensitic steel. In the case of the dual, f dual phase steel, I stay in this alpha plus gamma stability region. When you do this, we say we do an intercritical, intercritical anneal. And uh, you choose temperature, for instance, so that the fraction of uh, austenite is about 10%, mm -hmm. 0.1. Okay. And when you do this, the carbon content of the austenite, as you know, is here. Yes. You produce an austenite, which is very rich in carbon, yes. much, much more carbon than the nominal composition. Yes. Okay, and depending on the temperature you choose, you chose, you can uh, change the volume fraction of austenite and the carbon content of it. Okay, and then uh, you go from this high temperature, yes, to low temperature, very quickly, fast cooling, water quench even, um, and you uh, what what you get this austenite here transforms to martensite. Yes, and you can also here in this case do a small reheating to temper this martensite so that it's less brittle. Hmm? So you see that, of course, and if I told you, well, okay, let's try to do this with batch annealing. That would be very difficult, right? You wouldn't be able to, uh, you'd be able to heat, no problems, you'd be 
to, to go intercritical, but you would never be able to do this here, this fast cooling, right? So that is one of the reasons why continuous annealing is such an important uh, technology tool is because you can really, uh, in principle, generate uh, uh, very complex heat treatments and apply them on, 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 on sheet material in a continuous way. Okay. Good. So, um, the uh, material that we have now annealed yes, uh, will almost always go through one last uh, deformation step which we call skin pass rolling or temper rolling yes and in this process deformation process we apply a very small amount of deformation small amount of deformation typically half one maybe two percent two percent is already a lot yes and why do we do this um, we do this to um, achieve basically three things um, first of all is make some corrective actions to have a flat strip. Hmm? Second is, and, and this is much more important, is to remove yield points. So if you have low carbon steels, yes, typically you will not be able to avoid having some carbon in solution. Yes? And the material age, yes, and in order to limit the amount of aging and limit the, uh, the fact that, uh, that you could get uh, large yield point elongations, uh, you'd introduce dislocations in the material by temper rolling, all amount of dislocations. And the third one, which is also very important, is in temper rolling, you can apply a specific roughness on the surface of your sheet. Yes, and that is important when you're doing forming operations because, as you uh, already know, roughness of a surface has an impact on the friction, be frictional behavior of the surface. Hmm? Hmm? So uh, the, the, uh, the temper uh, mill or the skin pass mill moves yield points, applies surface texture, and improves flatness. Um, this is an interesting um, schematic, although it, it doesn't really reflect very well the, uh, the, s the size of the equipment. So the material comes out of the tandem mill, goes into the annealing, and can be hot dip galvanized, and then to the skin pass mill. When you electro-galvanize a product, which means you apply a zinc coating at the, uh, uh, by means of electro-deposition, uh, you do the uh, electro-deposition after the skin pass mill. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about this, this hot dip galvanizing and electro galvanizing next, next, uh, next week. Yeah? So, so a, a skin pass mill is basically a single, single stand mill, single stand mill. The, um, what is important is, uh, so small reductions, very large contact lengths, yes, to, um, uh, to apply uh, the roughness, yes. Um, it's often in dry uh, frictional conditions. And the, the deformation is not homogeneous, yes. Uh, Exactly because the, the deformation is, such, is so small, is so it is a, a, a small um, uh, is small, and uh, in fact, the, in uh, at, at small reductions, the elastic strains are comparable to the the, the plastic strains, and and most of the deformation is is a surface uh, deformation. Hmm? So this is what what happens if um, if you don't apply 
the skin pass, uh, yes, you get a material with this yield point elongation. Yeah? And you know that when you have a yield point elongation, um, this phenomenon, this, this flat uh, stress strain curve, that is due to the fact that you have localization of plastic deformation. Local deformation. Hmm? That means that um, when, you, when you strain the material, it will strain this amount, yes, locally, yes? And so if that happens, if they have on a, on a part you're forming, that means there'll be regions that have uh, f uh, deformed and regions that have not deformed. So you, get, you basically get uh, surface, um, uh, surface uh, defects, which we call stretcher strain marks, yes? yes. So you, you really, it, there are applications such as automotive applications of a, or any application where the product the visual appearance of the product is important uh, where, where stretcher strain marks are forbidden. Yeah? The automotive, uh, packaging, um, uh, um, furniture, uh, etc. Hmm? Cabinets uh, made out of steels, you don't want uh, any of this uh, behavior. So no stretcher strain marks um, when, when you have a continuous stress strain curve. Hmm? stress strain curve, this is what you want. And this is what the material stress strain curve looks like after the skin pass. Okay? So, uh, right, so basically what, what it looks like, you unwind, you have a delivery uh, um, uh, decoiler, and you rewind the material. There may be tension on the uh, exit size. And uh, so the, the, the amount of uh, strains in general for uh, drawing grades is, is small, is less than 1%. Um, certain grades, yes, you will increase or play with the amount of deformation to obtain a certain yield point or certain yield value. And cert there are other steels, electrical steels, where you will apply slightly higher deformation, but that's in order to achieve certain magnetic properties, which, which I will not um, uh, comment hmm? about. So um, if you look at the steel, which has a yield point elongation, yes, and you look at the amount, the percent of reduction you give, yes, and you look, you measure the yield strength, you see that the yield strength decreases as you remove the yield point, yes. And, and the maximum reduction is around 1%. Okay, so you, that's the typical strain that you give in a temper mill uh, pass. So this is uh, some, some actual data. You can see here, this is an, an, a so-called aluminum killed uh, deep uh, draw, drawing quality steel, yes? Um, and you see that the more I give uh, skin pass deformation, I get a decrease in the yield point, yes, and then if I make my, uh, if I give too much uh, deformation uh, after the disappearance of the yield point, I will of course strain harden the material, yes, and this is the amount of deformation that you want to give, yeah? the one that corresponds with the minimum in the yield point. Obviously, yes, this behavior only occurs in material, in materials that, uh, wh where carbon is in solid solution and where you get this looters uh, um, behavior, this uh, localized deformation. If you have an IF steel, yes, they never have uh, carbon in solid solution. So in this case, any um, skin pass reduction you give it translates into an increase in strength. And the same with, for instance, other s steel grades such as DP steel grades. Any time you give a deformation, you get a uh, strain hardening, basically. Hmm? 
Okay. Right. So, so uh, in uh, when you have a material that has a displays a yield point, I don't know if you can all see this. You have uh, if you have a yield point, you you not only have and you do a skin pass. So the, the, the fact that you have a reduction in in the uh, in the yield point is due to this fact, right? So, so uh, the, the skin pass deformation hmm, reduces the yield point. Yes. Um, what you also have is th the actual yield point elongation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that also is uh, reduced by the uh, the amount of deformation you give, hmm? and uh, and there is a, 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 the eff uh, also an effect of the um, of the, the force you apply. Hmm? Uh, uh, why is that? The reason is because of the inhomogeneity of the uh, the deformation. So very important skin pass rolling. Uh, don't think that the when you do skin pass rolling, it's like a regular rolling. You, know, you, you basically cr create regions that yield and regions that, um, uh, that, deform, that are deformed, others that are not deformed, yes? And, um, and so, um, uh, but in that way, you ensure that there is enough mobile dislocation density everywhere hmm, so that you don't get uh, localized yielding in your sheet as you deform it. Hmm? And it's also not an easy process. There's some interesting phenomena uh, that, that occur during uh, skin pass, uh, variation in the, in the load, for instance, uh, because the material itself, uh, before you skin pass it, uh, uh, has a yield point. So that sometimes uh, is visible during uh, skin pass rolling. Right, so, so skin pass is to remove uh, the yield point. The other thing we do with it is we control the surface roughness. Yes, And uh, so we basically imprint the roughness of the roll into the sheet surface. Yeah? And we can have, um, and, and th so the reason is, uh, we can control the distribution of the deep drawing, the forming lubricant, on our sheet this way. Hmm? Um, and transport the lubricant to the deformation zone. The roughness also has a big impact on the visual appearance after painting. Hmm? So for instance, you can have a conventional roughness that looks like this. Hmm? The lubricant may not be, distribution may be not homogeneous between the tool, forming tool, and the sheet steel. Or you can have a controlled roughness. Hmm? For instance, like this use case, I have little pockets of lubricants in the sheet, yes? Hmm? Uh, this one will have a better press performance than this one here. Hmm? And there are many uh, so-called roll texturing uh, technologies yes, to texture the work rolls of skin pass uh, mills. For instance, this is a random texture here that is achieved by so-called electro discharge texturing. And this is a non-random texture where, where we have these little craters, uh, a pattern of craters, and this is obtained by electron beam texturing. Hmm? Electron beam texturing is achieved by basically uh, drilling small holes in the uh, skin pass rolls uh, surface by means of an electron beam. Hmm? Okay, so what are the different technologies today? You have the traditional shot blast texturing, where you basically uh, shoot uh, uh, like hand blasting, but metal uh, particles on the roll surfaces, and when these particles uh, crash into the surface of the roll, they leave a little uh, plastically deformed region, yes? And you can control the roughness this way. You can do laser texturing, where you make little pits 
in the surface by means of laser beams, yes? You can do, as I said, electron beam texturing, with, where you do the same as with the la laser turing, but with uh, a laser beam that uh, 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 melts little craters in your uh, roll surface, or you can do the electro discharge texturing. Here you have also craters, but you, you generate them by a discharge, electrical discharge. And uh, these are the two, these two technologies are the main ones, uh, shot blast and electro discharge. This is an electro discharge texturing device. You can see here uh, you have a, a head which consists of electrodes which face the roll, yes? And, um, and, and so what you have between the electrode and the roll, you have a, a, a dielectric fluid, yes? Uh, so you increase the, uh, the voltage between these two and you create first a, dielect a conductive bridge, yes? Uh, from little particles that are in the uh, metallic particles that are in the um, uh, fluid here. Mm? Um, so these bridges um, will then uh, concentrate the um, uh, ele electric um, current, yes, and you'll get a voltage texturing spark between the electrode and the uh, roll. And that creates a bubble, yes, uh, very high temperatures and a liquid uh, melting of the surface of your uh, roll and that leaves a little crater. Okay, okay so, so you will adapt the roll surface, the roll texture to the type of strip you uh, process in the skin pass. Right? For instance, some uh, parts uh, are difficult to uh, form, so there you will focus on getting the right roughness for tribology, that is a low friction coefficient, yes, that gives you high yields in press forming, That's the, uh, that would be a roughness where you get, uh, allows you to have little oil pockets at the surface of your strip during, uh, when you're press forming the part, or you can have parts where the visual appearance is very important, and there you have also specific roughness. Hmm? And here, you, here you would like to have like a low roughness and a very small or controlled waviness to improve paint flow, to improve paint adhesion and visual appearance of the panel after uh, paint application. Hmm? So there's a whole science between uh, skin pass rolling which, which goes beyond just uh, removing the yield point. Okay. So um, we have uh, finished the section on uh, cold rolling and uh, our next lecture we will be uh, focusing on uh, coatings, putting, putting coatings on uh, these uh, strip materials. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.